All right, Dr. Brown, we are on the air and I believe everyone should be here. All right, hello everybody. Hello. Uh, welcome. And I'll call the meeting to order at 6.02. And I'll ask Angela if she'll do a committee roll call. No. Angela, star six will unmute and mute if you're having. Trouble. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Angela. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Charles Mayo. Kiplin Clemens. Present. Joe Morgan. Present. Jim MacArthur. Here. Dr. Portella. Present. Mackenzie Newkirk. Present. Uh, Commissioner Fitzpatrick was not attending. Dr. Brown? Here. George Bell? I'm here. Dr. Silvernail? I am here. Brian Barnett? Present. Jordan Smith? I'm here. Uh, Eric Grifton or someone from uh, Greenville Fire and Rescue? Anyone from Greenville Fire and Rescue? Okay. Jeff White? Jeff White? Scott Elliott? Randy Gentry? Randy Present. Gentry. Present. Okay. Is there anyone I missed? Okay, I'm done. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. So you all received a copy of the minutes uh, via email. Are there any changes or corrections or additions to the agenda? Yeah, Dr. Brown, this is Jim. Uh, need to add a non-E franchise C and J ambulance transport to the decision item. Okay. All right. We'll add a non-E um, uh, just a non-E vote for item for decision. All right. Anything else? All right. I guess we need to take a vote on this. So, Angela, I guess we'll have to do a roll call unless Jordan thinks not on this one. I, I, unfortunately, I think we have to do a roll call vote. Um, okay, that's fine. Okay, are you ready? Yes. So I'll just go down, I just go down the list of everyone? Yes. Of of Angela, okay. just of the the members, not the staff liaisons like right. myself. Yep. Okay, but just call them out. Okay, uh, Kip, Kip, Kipling Clemens. Yes, we're voting on to add that to the agenda. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, approving the agenda with that addition. Joe Morgan. Yes. Jim MacArthur. Yes. Dr. Patella? Yes. Mackenzie Newkirk? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Silvernail? Yes. 
Okay, that's it. All right. All right. So the agenda is approved with the addition of a non e franchise vote. Next, we need to approve the minutes. Are there any changes, corrections, or addition to the minutes? Motion approved. Skip the a second. All right. All right. I think if there are no corrections, then we can accept that by acclamation without a vote. I so that. hearing no corrections, then we'll accept the minutes as written. Thank you, everybody. Anybody sign up for a squad comment tonight? All right, hearing none, we shall move into items for report. Our first item for report is the medical director's report, Dr. Portella. Good evening, everybody, how are you? Uh, I only have a few things to say. Uh, I I'm going to keep talking about cardiac arrest because I, I think it's such an important topic, so I apologize for it if I'm beating a, a dead topic here. But uh, just to recap uh, for the people that weren't here last time, uh, last year was a, was a large, uh, uh, unfortunately, a large uh, a, a year for us. We had a spike of about 75% more of cardiac arrests. Uh, we had 244 in the year versus the year before in 2019, where we only had one, 156, which is usually where we fluctuate, although we have gone up to a 200. Uh, definitely last year was one of our, our largest cardiac arrest years, unfortunately. Uh, there's a concern across the country that that's not, I don't think that's just us in, in this region. It's across the state and probably across the nation. Uh, and like I said last time, does it have to be specifically due to COVID or COVID consequences, like not going to your doctor, uh, not going out and, and seeking medical help, delaying medical help because of fear of COVID and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a multifaceted and multi-regional uh, problem. So I can't tell you, so was, we, we had more people going to cardiac arrest just because we had, it was all related to COVID, but it, 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 there's more consequences to that the same way as after a hurricane, we have hurricane related death that are not because of the uh, direct consequences of the winds or storm surge or anything like that. Uh, obviously we track this uh, every year. I can tell you right now in 2021, we're up to 46 cardiac arrests uh, up to uh, March 21st. If you look at similar date last year, we're up to 57. So we're a little lower than, and in 2019, it was 43 around that same date. So we're, we're closer to what we were in 2019. So I hope that that's the trend for this year and we don't see that spike in cardiac arrest again. Too early to tell you about survival up to this point. We're talking about just two months data, so I don't have enough for that to tell you, uh, but, talking about cardiac arrest survival, again, we're going back to, we're looking at what happened in the, re in the region, in the state and nationwide. Uh, we were having a lecture uh, yesterday, Wednesday from a very good friend of mine who's the Wake EMS director, medical director. And he's saying that what they think is that being a trend of uh, lower survival uh, in the last year in the nation, again, multiple reasons, COVID, uh, uh, changes in practice, changes in lifestyle and changes of people's attitude against, uh, towards medical care. So we should have, hopefully, we should have what they call the CARES database uh, information uh, back, I think around April or May, and I'll have better information for you probably for the next meeting, hopefully. Uh, what are we doing to do better, right? And that's the that's the important question. How how do, can we do this better? So there's no question that ABL was a great addition, right? ABL uh, was giving us the ability of knowing uh, automatic vehicle location. I apologize, sometimes I forget. Uh, ABL uh, allows us to know where some of our units are specifically geographically in the map. So instead of dispatching uh, uh, based on a station that the ambulance might be in transit because they just drop off a patient or, or they went to get 
gasoline, diesel, as simple as that. Now we know physically where they are. So that has helped us to reduce time to CPR to the fibrillation, which it's basically the, the, one of the guiding lights of American Heart Association and cardiac arrest uh, response. It is early notification, uh, you know, early CPR, early notification of 911, high quality CPR, early defibrillation. And the only way, and, and even though our telecommunicators in the 911 center are excellent in trying to push people to do CPR, even when they don't know and give them the instructions to start CPR while EMS is on their way and first responders, high quality CPR can only be done by EMS. It's, it's, that, that's something that we do. Uh, and, and we have, we have realized that just doing CPR is good, but doing high quality CPR is far superior. Uh, minimizing uh, compression pauses, uh, doing good death, uh, not going too fast, not hyperventilation, hyperventilating patients, the free relation, so stuff like that. And, and unfortunately, not everybody has an AED at home, right? So even though they're doing CPR, they don't have the defibrillator. So that's where EMS also comes in. Plus the other stuff that we do, obviously, advanced airway management, medications, et cetera. So with ABL, we, we, we are in better position to do that now that we have implemented fully ABL, that we know we, we have tried it out, we have, you know, kind of get the, the kinks out. The, the other reason why this is so important, I, I kind of mention it because, and, and, and American Heart Association says this all the time, we kind of forget, right? For every minute that passes, for a person that went into cardiac arrest without CPR or defibrillation, the chances of survival go down seven to 10%. Every 60 seconds, that's what happens. So for a lot of EMS complaints, ankle sprains, minor car accidents, minutes don't matter that much, right? Yes, but I, I get it as a, as a person, as a patient, every second matters. But in the clinical outcomes, it doesn't make a big difference, right? But in cardiac arrest, it matters. Every little second matters. And if I'm going to talk about it, I, I should bring this up. I think we should strive to make sure that we send the closest unit every single time to every single cardiac arrest in the county for the benefit of our patients, residents, visitors, business owners, et cetera. There, there's no way around it that, that that is the best practice everywhere in the country. And if you want, a, 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 I'll be a blanket statement that that should be, we should strive to do that every single time. No questions asked. Uh, border shouldn't be a difference. Color should not be a difference. Basically, like they said, you know, it doesn't, should, should not affect religion race, sex, preference, or anything like that. We should have that for every single person in county. Uh, seven, 10% every minute. It's a big, big thing, right? And obviously reach out and make sure that everybody learns how to do hands-only CPR. There's no around that. Uh, that's basically what I want, what I have. And I, 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 I Hopefully, I, I, everybody here can agree with me that that's the best practice. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Dr. Bertella? All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Our next report is the Public Health Director's Report, Dr. Silvernail. Hey, Mike. Hey, uh, rest of the committee. Um, thanks publicly to Mike and Jim and Dr. Portella for helping out with our vaccine clinic today. Uh, we did just shy of 250 folks with the J&J &J vaccine at the Ag Center today. So again, uh, thank you uh, guys. Um, thanks to Randy for letting you guys come over and help us. Uh, you guys have been a great partner through this. I want to just pull up a couple of slides here from my report to the Board of Health from uh, Tuesday night. And um, oh, shoot, I don't know. Make the full screen for you, make it a little easier to see. There we go. So this was um, when I reported to the Board of Health in February. These were our numbers in February. Uh, over the preceding 14 days, we had 1,400 cases, a little over 1,400 cases, about 101 cases a day. 
Uh, we were about 7.6 cases per thousand residents in the county. About 8.8% of the county had been infected and about 91% of our cases were recovered. Uh, we were at 72 fatalities, but our case fatality rate had dropped to a new low of 0 0.4. Percent positivity was eight and a half, 8.4, down from 13.6 in mid-January. Tuesday, this week, uh, we're down to 562 cases per day. Uh, that was 40 cases, uh, or 562 cases over 14 days. That's 40 cases per day. Uh, today, this is down even better. We're at 475 today, uh, which gets us down into the 30 cases per day range. Our active cases per thousand as of Tuesday were 3.0. Quick calculation this afternoon when I got home from our clinic, we're at like 2.6 uh, uh, cases per day now. Um, total cases, we're about 9.6, just shy of 10% of the county uh, that we know to have been infected with this. In reality, if for every case we've seen, there's probably at least one case we haven't. In some age groups, probably more than one case that we haven't seen. Um, and our estimated recovered was up to 96.4%. We'd had 83 deaths. We've added one since, uh, since Tuesday. So we're, we're now at 84 deaths. And our case fatality rate is still at, at 0.5, which is really kind of the bottom of the, the reference range for that, uh, for the course of the pandemic. On Tuesday, we were at 5.0% positivity, which was the lowest positivity we've had um, um, throughout the pandemic. Tonight, when I got home and looked at our percent positivity, we were at 4.8, so we've dropped even more since just Tuesday. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna stop that for a second. And with your permission, Mr. Chair, I wanna pull up the vaccine dashboard and just show you all the vaccine dashboard real quick. This is part of the state COVID dashboard. And if you haven't seen this, I'm happy to walk you through it. But I think the thing that everybody's interested in is, well, how many vaccines have we given? And this was updated through March 10th, uh, midnight. So midnight last night. Um, and um, when you scroll down, you can see the percentages across doses given in the state, uh, total doses over 3 million total doses given. Excuse me. Here's a breakdown by allocation and, and um, first and second doses. Single shot, um, uh, we've only given 26% of those that arrived, um, but they went out in pretty large aliquots. You know that um, Biden got 12,000 doses of the single shot vaccine uh, and they gave us 500 and we've used about half of that today. Um, when you scroll down to the map, and I'm not sure if this means this was updated today or if that's just the date that we're looking at it, but I think the Pitt County number, you see we're one of the darker counties and um, it goes, it goes dormant when this dashboard sit for a minute, it'll, it'll reload, there we go. So you come up and, and look at Pitt County and you can see that we've given, you know, when they say partially vaccinated, they mean folks who received um, one shot. So we've given over 32,000 first doses of vaccine, that would be Pfizer and Moderna. We have given full people fully vaccinated, uh, generally the folks who have received the two shot vaccine at this point, and that's 23,000 plus almost 24,000. When we look at people who are at least partially vaccinated, we're at 17.8% of our population and the percent fully vaccinated at 13, 13.2%. With that single dose vaccine here, that, that uh, partially vaccinated number is gonna go up uh, even quicker. Uh, when you put those two together, you say, well, hey, we've got 10% of our population that has immunity by disease, 13.7% that's vaccinated fully, puts us over 23%, so more than one in five folks are now immune in the county. And I think that's really starting to help take a bite out of transmission. So, so our numbers are moving in a favorable direction in terms of the disease um, prevalence, and then our uh, vaccinations are moving in the right direction in terms of going up. So, so very happy to report that tonight and um, uh, happy to take questions from anybody if anybody's got questions. I don't, want, I don't have a question, but I do want to emphasize what Dr. Silner is saying and, and the importance of getting vaccinated when, when it's your turn, uh, promoting vaccination. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot that making barriers for uh, people getting vaccinated. And, and, and if we want to go back to normal, this is our biggest weapon to getting back to normal. This is our biggest web bump to keep our family members safe. Uh, 
one of the things that we, Jim and I have had is that we, you know, not all our EMS providers think that they should get vaccinated because of a number of reasons, you know, and I'm not here to obviously discuss all of them, uh, but I want to make sure to tell the team members of this group uh, to be advocates for vaccination. And every time I see somebody that I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Simler in the vaccination clinics, every time now, what I tell them is you are an ambassador to vaccination, please spread the word, tell people when it's their chance to get vaccinated. I did, you did, we should all do it unless we have a medical, a real medical reason why not to do it. All right, thank you. Dr. Silverdale, given what um, Dr. Portella just said, could you just say where we're at in the I guess the state's classification for vaccinations, we're in group. We're in group three now, Joe. So group three is fully open. So that is essential workers. So that includes all of our school faculty, staff, uh, our childcare workers. It's folks who work transit. It's uh, law enforcement. It's rank and file firefighters are now eligible. Basically anybody that leaves the home and interacts with the public uh, in the eyes of the state is considered an essential worker. So um, uh, there is a classification system out there in the state's deeper dive, but sort of the simple way to think about it, and this is from Secretary Cohen herself, if you leave the house and you work with people, then you're an essential worker. And uh, we're, we've been told uh, in the news today that the governor's gonna open to those with significant comorbidities beginning next week. So on the 17th on St. Patrick's Day, Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. So on St. Patrick's Day, we will we will open for folks with comorbidities, um, and hopefully, we'll have supply to support that additional additional group. So. All right, thank you, Dr. Silvernail. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Great, you're welcome. Thank you. Our next report then is the EMS Rescue Association report, George Bell. Good evening, everybody. Nothing to report today. All right. Thank you, George. Uh, there is no one from GFR, and there's no one from non-emergency for a report tonight. So we'll go to the Pitt Community College EMS training report from Mackenzie Newkirk. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are open and running wide open. We have uh, three ENT classes going on right now in an advanced ENT. And we are full through July for our next EMT classes. So we have a lot of uh, a lot of people taking interest in this field right now. And I think that's a blessing for all of us. We have some new classes running that we haven't either run in a long time or run before. Um, we're doing EMS methodology. We're doing a paramedic refresher as, long, as well as an EMT refresher. And we're also working on a nursing to paramedic bridge um, at this time. So a lot of things in the work we are... Uh, we're rolling right along, and if we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. All right, thank you. Any uh, questions for Mackenzie? All right, thanks, Mackenzie. Our next report is from the Emergency Management Director, Randy Gentry. Randy? Good evening, Dr. Brown and the rest of the committee members. Uh, I would just like to mention that this week is uh, severe weather week. And today's focus is uh, lightning strikes. And I would encourage everyone to go to our Facebook page to get more information. And if they would share so others can receive that information. Uh, that's all I have tonight. All right, any questions on that? Hearing none, we'll go on to the MS coordinators report. Jim MacArthur. Hey everybody. Uh, since uh, Dr. Brown didn't ask me to bring an educational session uh, to the committee tonight because of the budget presentation, um, I don't have anything. Uh, just like to thank you for your support, uh, especially the community members here that uh, you're paying attention and helping look after the, the EMS system. So thank you all for everything you do. All right. Any questions for Jim? Yeah, I have one. Uh, my question would be that we need to, or my comment would be that we need to consider 
our QRV vehicles as well as our fleet uh, as we look at replacements. Understood, yes, sir. All right, thank you, that's a good point. Thank you, Charles. Any other questions or comments for Jim? All right, our financial report, Brian Barnett. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, uh, good evening, everybody on the uh, committee. Um, I don't have as much of a formal report tonight as, as we are going to move into the budget later on in our meeting, but I just want to point out the fact that from the EMS fund standpoint, we are doing quite well. We are taking advantage of some opportunities out there. Our transport revenue is, uh, as, as you will see in our presentation through the end of February, is doing exceptional. Um, this could potentially be um, probably our best transport revenue year in the last five or six years. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, I think Jim has worked with some people, in my, some of my staff to implement some new software. And I think that has had a tremendous effect on our abilities to collect um, the revenue. So um, I don't have any other formal report question, uh, to, to present, but um, look forward to presenting the budget here in a little bit. All right, thank you, Brian. Any questions for Brian? All right, so now we'll move into items for decision and we have two tonight. One is to recommend to the county commissioners the appointment of Mackenzie Newkirk to the EMS Oversight Committee. And again, for those of you who don't know Mackenzie, she is uh, now the Director of Fire EMS and Emergency Management Training. And she has been coming um, as an interim representative for uh, Jack Cody, who's no longer working at Pitt Community College. Anything you want to say about yourself, Mackenzie? Um, no, sir, I'm just, I feel honored to be here. Um, I've spent the past 10 years working fire and EMS in this county and now enjoy doing the training. So I, I just look forward to working with everybody in the future. Um, and again, Pitt Community College, we're, we're always here for anybody in the community who needs us. All right, great. So do I hear a motion to recommend the appointment of Mackenzie Newkirk? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Charles Mayo seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, do we have to do a roll call on that? Aye, aye, aye. Jordan? Uh, yeah, unfortunately. Okay, that's fine. No, I just forget, I'm in automatic mode here. So Angela will do a roll call vote. Okay, Charles Mayo. Yes. Kipling Clemens. Yes. Joe Morgan. Yes. Jim MacArthur. Yes. Dr. Portella. Yes. Does uh, Mackenzie, I'm assuming she votes? Not yet. I, yeah, I would say no. I'd say no, yeah. Okay, um, Dr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Silvernail? Yes. George Bell? Oh, yes, absolutely. All right, is that everybody? All right, then. Yes, okay, that's everyone. All right, then it looks like uh, it's unanimous vote, so. Welcome, Mackenzie. We'll, this is actually a recommendation to the county commissioners, and they make the final appointment, but we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move into the discussion of our fiscal year 2021-22 proposed budget, and I'm going to introduce Brian again to do that. Right, thank you again, Dr. Brown. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation. And it's relatively brief, and we're going to just kind of get right to the point. But feel free at any point um, 
the way the presentation screen is set up, I can't see you, but if anybody has any questions, just feel free to uh, jump in. But uh, obviously we're gonna present the budget tonight. I uh, just wanna go through the budget process with you guys. First of all, uh, we did receive requests from our county operated EMS and from our nonprofit EMS squads. Um, as you guys remember last year in March is one of our last things we did in person. Um, we did go through the budget for the current fiscal year and you all did um, recommend increasing the tax rate from 4.6 cents to 5.95 cents. Um, so this is the first year of that tax increase. Um, part of that increase, as you guys may remember, was we were uh, looking to help rebuild our fund balance. We were looking to not have to use fund balance to balance the budget. And we were looking to get to a point where we could um, make sure we were replacing at least two vehicles a year. Um, so that tax increase definitely has helped. Um, we've also had a lot of help within the community just because our overall values in Pitt County are going up as we see more development and growth in the county. And because of that, um, as, as you all probably um, figured um, would be the case, we are not going to recommend and we, we do not see a need to recommend a tax increase going into the 21-22. So just to give you some trends, I know this was a big part of our conversation last year. As you can see, the tax rate from 2003 to 2021, um, we have gone through some periods of time where we have kept the tax rate relatively flat, uh, the same. Um, I anticipate the uh, 5.9 uh, being the tax rate over the next few years as, as we continue to grow. I think that will be sufficient um, unless you all at some point in the future recognize the need to in increase either the capital outlay or what we pay to our uh, nonprofit uh, squads, I think the 5.9 will be sufficient. Um, transport revenue, this is our biggie. Um, you know, we have a hand in this as, as we collect revenue. Um, as you can see over the years, 2006 was kind of an anomaly year. Excuse me, 2016 was an anomaly year. 2018, we, we went right over 2 million. And uh, here in 2021, um, if I had to forecast out, I would say we will probably either be very close to 2 million or we will go over that 2 million threshold um, by the end of this year. Um, fund balance, as we ended the year last year, um, just wanna point out, uh, this was a big area that we wanted to talk and this is probably the reason why we increased the tax rate. Uh, we did lower our fund balance down to $316,860. Um, that was a reduction of $762,477 in 22. We also had a reduction in fund balance in 2019 of 604678 Now, part of that was the fact that uh, we, we were building up our fund balance to help purchase vehicles and some other capital needs, and we did take advantage of that last year. Um, but that's a trend, obviously, from a financial standpoint, uh, that we probably do need to avoid. Um, especially when you look at the last bullet point and you keep in mind that we had to get a transfer from the general fund. So if the general fund had not, um, and, and the board of county commissioners had not approved that transfer of 425,000, we would have been running a negative fund balance, which in theory, we can run a negative fund balance as a fund just based on the way the county's money is all set up. We will never not have money for EMS, but on paper uh, and in the books, it does not look very well upon the county um, to have a negative fund balance in any fund. So um, so right now, if we hadn't have gotten that transfer, um, we wouldn't be at 316.860. So the actual budget itself, um, as you can see on the left-hand side is a breakdown. Um, and this is pretty much at the highest level. I mean, obviously there's more detail in, in the squads, there's more detail in, in the um, county operated departments, but at the core, um, you can see what was approved last year on the far left. You can see what was requested. Um, pretty much um, all the squads, if you look at what was approved um, in the current year and you look at what was requested, um, each squad did ask for more funding than uh, the current year. Um, with those additional requests, um, that would have put us over budget 96325 and as I just alluded to on the fund balance, we are trying to build that back up. So as we transition over to the recommended side, uh, we are keeping the nonprofit squad request at the same level 
uh, of current year. Um, where we are maintaining the tax rate. We are not using fund balance to balance the budget uh, from, the from the recommended standpoint. We are looking at, to add four new paramedic uh, positions in our um, county departments. Um, we're hoping that uh, with the four new paramedic positions that we can reduce the need to use as much overtime and part-time hours. Um, it's actually slightly cheaper uh, in this case, when, when we look at our historical um, usage over this fiscal year and last fiscal year, um, it, it actually it should be more efficient and more cost effective for the county to add four new positions than to continue to exhaust uh, and go over budget on overtime and part time. And then lastly, this is this is I'm going to I'm going to go into more detail of this on our next slide. But we'll, but based on our revenue this year and what we're projecting next year. We have additional money available to where uh, we are looking to reallocate funding out on a call volume basis. And um, I'll just jump right into it. But basically what we what, what we've set up when we look at the calendar year uh, of 2020, when we look at the actual amount of calls that are run by each nonprofit squad, we have created a tier system um, where each uh, nonprofit within that tier system would have the opportunity to come back to the EMS Oversight Committee. And if they can demonstrate a need, then we have created a contingency amount um, within the budget that they can tap into, um, assuming, assuming revenues are doing well next year. Um, and, and those particular nonprofit squads can come back to the committee, ask for it, and then we would still have to um, because it's a budget chain, we still have to go back to the Board of County Commissioners anytime we tap into contingency um, for approval. But um, you can see based on call volume, um, those with the, the two with the most calls are in tier one and the next group is tier two down to tier three and then tier four. So th those squads would have an opportunity next fiscal year if they can come back and demonstrate a need to the, to the committee and the committee approves it to recommend it to the Board of County Commissioners. And then we would look to extend those, um, those nonprofit budgets. I, I do wanna point out that this new system that we're looking at implementing next year does not mean that if you receive the additional funding that that becomes your base budget for the next budget. So these would be one-time allocations we would like to continue the tier system going forward, but it's always going to be contingent upon anticipated revenues in the next year. So as we move forward, there may be additional, there may be more money than what we have set out now. There could be less, there could be none. Um, but at, at this point, based on the math, there is an opportunity um, to, to, to look at this as an option going into next fiscal year. So in conclusion, um, Obviously, as I've pointed out, this fiscal year is doing much better than last year. We are looking at a tier system to allocate additional funding as needed. Uh, like I said, it's not cumulative. It's gonna be subject to the annual budget process. And, um, you know, the big E for, at least from, from my standpoint, um, we are looking to balance this budget without using fund balance. Um, so I think that's an important aspect when you consider the fact that, and I'm gonna jump back a minute, if you look at our capital outlay, you can look at the current year, we only budgeted 225 and we are back to um, half a million dollars, which should allow us to get two vehicles with fully loaded with the new stretcher system um, in place. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, anytime we can do, we can do that. Plus have a contingency set aside for the nonprofits and not have to use fund balance. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a good day. So, that's the budget. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. <coughs> All right, are there any questions for Brian? I would have a comment. Brian, are we, are we also calculating, I know we talk about the two trucks, but are we, and I'm, I'm certainly glad for that. Uh, we need that to, to sort of get our fleet up from some previous years but do, do we calculate anything for QRV cars? 
Uh, Mr. Mayo, I would actually have to default to either Jim or Randy on, on how they calculate the money. Um, from where I said, as long as we stay within budget, I'm happy. So okay. if, if Jim or Randy want to jump in on that one. Yeah, Mr. Charles, it's like uh, we, we discussed this, Jim. Um, we're basically trying to look at our at our fleet and ask the finance folks, you know, for what we think we need. Um, obviously, we the way our fleet is set up, I think we're looking at going to need more than two trucks at a time to turn over a 20-vehicle uh, a fleet in the next in less than three or four years. But... Uh, and also, you know, as our as our system changes, including the, the Tahoe's in there, on that. Yeah. Um, so we're we're just going to take the approach of uh, trying to ask for what we need, and then uh, similar to everybody else, you know, we we'll, we may not get everything all the time, but uh, we'll we'll be frugal about it and figure out what we need. <laughs> okay, thank you. This Can question. This question may be uh, answered by Randy or Jim or Brian, you may be able to answer, but do we have clear guidelines for contingency fund requests? Just come before the oversight. I understand that part, but I guess as far as uh, what's eligible for requests or is it just, I mean, as or is it kind of all, all, not all the board? <laughs> is it just as need as needed as the agency sees the need? As needed and when. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, what I'd like to do is to entertain a motion to approve. And if we have a motion on the floor, we can have further discussion if necessary. Motion to approve. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All right. Uh, Dr. Pratella moves and Charles Mayo seconds. Is there further discussion? Michael, I just wanted to ask um, the community paramedic program. So now that's fully funded through our EMS funds. Is that correct? That is correct. Other than the part-time position to still grant funded. I'm sorry, what now, Randy? Full-time, yes, is fully funded uh, and a county employee, but the part-time is, uh, position is still grant funded. Okay. Yeah, for everybody, to, right now we have a full-time paramedic and a part-time paramedic that's grant funded. So we actually expanded the program. Thanks to your, uh, everybody's support here. All right, any other questions? Dr. Brown, this is Angela. Does this require a roll call? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let, you want me to go ahead and start? Now, let me see if there's any more questions first. Any other questions? Hearing none and sensing you're ready to vote. Uh, now, Angela, if you could do the roll call, please. Okay, thank you. Charles Mayo? Yes. Kiplin Clemens? Yes. Joe Morgan? Yes. Jim MacArthur? Yes. Dr. Portella? Yes. Mackenzie Newkirk? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Silvernail? Yes. George Bell? No. All right. Thank you. If that's all the votes, the majority uh, is aye. So the recommendation passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian and Jim and uh, Randy for all the work on the budget and the proposal. All right. Now we're going to move into items for discussion and uh, uh, this is the Winterville EMS funding request. So I'll look to Jim or Randy. Is there a Winterville representative that wants to present that or is that going to be presented by one of the staff? Um, 
Yeah, can we, before we go to that, can we do the uh, decision item um, for the 90 transport? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my fault. I didn't write that in that section. So I apologize. Right. We do have okay. the additional um, item for decision of the NANI application. So Jim, you're going to present that? Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, try to keep it brief with that. Uh, we have a, a no, another uh, potential NANI transit company. It's called C&J Ambulance Transport. Um, they are a company that's, that's based in Halifax that's already in the business of doing wheelchair and uh, ambulatory transport, not ambulances, but uh, uh, like taxi type service. They have expressed the desire to get in the ambulance transit business and uh, reached out to us. So what has to happen since they're not franchised in any county and they do not yet have an ambulance license they have to receive a franchise approval in a, in a single county uh, before they can get that license number from the state. So they applied to us. Um, we're the only county they've applied to so far. And uh, I've gone through their application. Be happy to share it with anybody. But um, a couple of things I noted, and I just want to report to the committee that uh, everything looks fairly standard um, as far as similarities to our other non-E's, uh, but they will have a list of items they have to complete. Uh, assuming approval from this board, there would be a, several contingencies um, before I would be willing to take it before the county commissioners. But I wanted to bring it before you tonight, knowing that we don't have another scheduled meeting until September. Um, and then I'd like to get approval to move forward with them, um, to work with them on that. But. Uh, the items that uh, I've gone through their application that they need to do, uh, they would need a physical location in Pitt County. Obviously, that's part of our franchise. And in several companies, if you recall, uh, have asked to wait until approval from the Board of Commissioners before they purchase a hard location just because of the cost. Um, again, they have not hired any EMTs or uh, other providers to work for their company. Uh, the, the manager, who's actually a former chief from uh, Aurora EMS down in Beaufort County, um, has expressed the desire that he'd like to see if we are okay with moving forward prior to them bringing on the cost of personnel. I told him that I thought that would be okay because there would be some time from approval at the oversight committee before going to the commissioners. But they would need to hire a staff of EMTs and uh, medical responders prior to becoming operational. Um, I've asked for uh, several proof of insurances that our franchise ordinance calls for. They, they're just supposed to have uh, general liability in their vehicle insurances. And uh, they have submitted those. We've been having an email discussion about where they are. Um, so I should be getting those soon. Additionally, an FCC license or approval to use a radio system. Uh, the precedent here would be since they're a non-licensed company, our 911 communications center can approve them to operate uh, on our UHF frequencies if they desire, or they can submit a letter to the state to use the Viper system, uh, if assuming they purchase their own radio. Um, those are the those are the items that they'll need to complete before I would be willing to submit to the commissioners for approval, uh, and then do site inspection. Um, they have paid their uh, franchise application fee, the $1,200 uh, application fee. And um, so it'd be required just requesting from this board um, approval contingent you know, upon completion of the, the necessary items and, and entertain any questions as well. Well, so you're moving, putting that forward as a motion. Is there a second to Jim's motion and then we'll have discussion? Dr. Portella second. So right now the motion on the floor is to uh, make a recommendation to county commissioners to approve this non-E provider contingent on meeting the requirements that Jim has outlined. Any questions or comments? Uh, I have one. 
did I understand that they have not run an ambulance and are not in other county? My memory would serve me that most of the other applicants have actually been in business and have not have expanded here, but have not wanted to just start here. Is that correct, or am I am I confused? Uh, yes. So uh, most of so we do have one franchise in the county that is uh, Ambu Care Medical Transport that was a first time uh, franchisee. They were a local company in Mary's Care Transportation, but they had not been in the ambulance business. And so they actually only operate in Pitt County. So we assisted them through the application process with the state to get that. Uh, but our other five non-E providers, uh, yes, that's correct. They were expansions, uh, but we have had the one that was similar to this. Uh, only difference being that uh, this company is headquartered in Halifax uh, with their um, their wheelchair transport. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown, I have clarification of the motion. Are we um, approving Jim to move forward with the information and then once all the uh, boxes are checked, then it will go before the Board, board of Commissioners? Is that what we're approving? Yes. Is that is that your understanding, Jim? Yes, sir. Uh, the only thing that would go before the commissioners, uh, Kiplin, prior to being completed would be a, a physical location in the county. Um, I won't require them to buy a rent space uh, ahead of a commitment from the county that they'll be here. But is the motion not that we are, this committee is, a, if we agree with it, that we would approve um, this, we would recommend that this franchise be, or this company be allowed to franchise here in Pitt County. That's what would go before the Board of Commissioners, provided they've met all the criteria that you would require of them. Right, other than the physical location. All right, any other questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, Angela, could you do a roll call vote, please? Okay, Charles Mayo? No. Kipling Clemens? No. Joe Morgan? Yes. Jim MacArthur? Yes. Dr. Portella? Yes. Mackenzie Newkirk? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Silvernail? Yes. George Bell? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, the majority is for I, so the motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Now we'll move on to item for discussion, for discussion, and that's the Winterville EMS uh, fiscal year 2021 funding request. So, Jim, is there someone here from Winterville to make that request or? Is staff going to make that request on our behalf? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we spoke about it. I spoke to uh, Rick today. He's actually on if there are questions. But uh, we received the, the email request uh, from Rick uh, regarding the budget request. And we actually forwarded along to Brian and their staff uh, since they sort of are the keepers of the, of the budget and they have a better understanding of what, uh, what we can stand to do and uh, so I'm gonna let Brian explain the, the request and you know, what, what the fund can support. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, so um, Chief Britt at uh, Winterville has requested an additional, um, for, for this fiscal year, uh, not, not, not next year, but this fiscal year, an additional $38,000 um, and if um, 
if I misspeak on, on what you're asking to use that money for, please um, chime in and clarify. Um, I, I think a big portion of this additional need um, is, to, is to make up a shortfall due to increased overtime costs, fuel, supplies, vehicle insurance. Um, it's my understanding that um, last fiscal year also put a, a, a hurt on, on, on the uh, department. I think they were short and had to tap into some of their um, savings to balance out the year. So as they got midway through this year, um, they were about 17,000 at the end of December short. They were, they were looking to be short. And um, so just doing the simple math, um, they're asking for a full year's worth of, um, of the shortage. So that would be 38,000 um, for this year. Um, my, my only concern is, 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 as I mentioned in our budget, that we are trying to build back up the fund balance um the you know the, the county the, the county had to come in last year and help out the EMS fund um to the tune of four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, which which did allow us to finish the year in the positive. Um we we are doing very well this year. Um so I, I definitely think it it's an item that you all should consider um because we are doing well this year. Um uh, but just keep in mind that uh, we are trying to build that fund balance back up. And that um, we, we don't necessarily want to get in a habit um, of request, um, but, if, but if you all choose um, and see the need, then we would take this recommendation from you all to the county board of commissioners. It would probably be our April 5th meeting. Um, it would require a budget amendment. It would require approval from them um, to officially make it official um, because it is outside of what we put in the original budget for our nonprofit squads. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, if if uh, Rick wants to chime in any, um, I actually leave that up to up to Dr. Brown if you, if you will allow that. But um, but definitely um, um, from our standpoint, like I said, the year's going well. Um, so I do think you all should consider it. So your your suggestion is considering the full request. Uh, I, my suggestion is you all debate it. Um, I think we're doing well enough that it's it's worth debating. Dr. Brown, if you would permit, I would love to speak to the group. Sure, Rick. Sure, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to come before you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, and, you know, all I want is a balanced budget. And if you'll just bear with me for just a minute, I think I can paint the picture for you in terms of how we got to where we were. Last March of 2020, right before the pandemic was, was officially declared, I went and met with Dr. Brown and Jim and Randy, and I, I don't think Dr. Patella showed, but I told them I had this problem coming. The county's advertising right now for part-time paramedics for $18.09 a share. Well, we were paying our paramedics around $16 to $17 a share. So if you do the math on a dollar per hour times 48, because there's two paramedics on the truck times 365, that's a big increase in your budget. We used to rely on part-time paramedics from other squads. We still do that for the most part. But when you have a natural disaster or you get a call back and they have to go to their full-time job, that leaves us holding the bag. So we were proactive and we hired two full-time paramedics. The town of Wyndham was a great partner. They allow them to be employees of the town, but we have to pay for the full cost of their benefits and that's expensive. Uh, the other thing is we furnished all of our own trucks in Winterville. The county doesn't own our fleet, so we haven't participated in the fleet management program and maybe we should. But the county pays the insurance on all of the fleet owned trucks that they have. We have to pay our own insurance. That's about a $15,000 a year cost that we're covering. Plus we've paid for our trucks. They're both paid for it. We've got striker strike stretchers and the load systems on both those trucks. Uh, but with COVID, with some retirements, with some people leaving us, we've had to pay some overtime. And when our medics take vacation or they're out six, we can't take the truck out of service. We have to keep it staffed. I, and I love the idea that you son about the different tiers of us being able to get more money to cover the cost of easy IOs and CPAP machine, uh, devices and Zola electrodes and King Airways and about $12,000 we spend a year in diesel fuel. I've got all the sheets records. 
I'll tell you that we do a photo fundraiser every year. We're trying, we've netted about $13,000 this year. We've applied for sales tax refunds for where we bought the stretchers. stretchers. That's going to net us about $6,000. Uh, we apply for motor fuel refund on the uh, fuel tax we pay on all the diesel fuel we buy. If anybody's got any other ideas that can help me be more efficient or run the squad, I'm happy. But those of you that know what I do for a living, I cannot have a not balanced budget. So we were able to sell the building on Chapman Street. We we netted about $92,000 out of that building. But if we lose $30,000 a year for three years, we're going to be gone. And, I, you know, we're a busy squad. I did take, I did do some quick math while Brian was doing his presentation. The county budget for the two county owned operated systems and the, the 33 truck, which is, I call it two and a half squads. If you did that math, y'all were operating those two and a half squads at $756,678 a piece. And you're expecting us to do it for 442. I mean, that math just doesn't add up. I'm not asking for 700,000, I just need roughly another 30,000 or so to balance my budget. If we have any left of what you give me, I'll give it back. I'm not asking to build up a reserve. I just want to keep the reserve that we have. And I want to continue the good partnership with the town and the good partnership I have with the county. We want to stay a part of the system. Um, I think I've ever mentioned everything that was on my list. Uh, I did note that the EMS tax went up 29%. We didn't get any increase. The county squads is, if I did the math right, is getting about a 6% increase. If you gave me a 6% increase, that's roughly $24,000. That would probably satisfy my need for this year and next year. I'll be glad to be quiet now and take some, take anybody's questions, but thank you for the opportunity to come before you. All right, so, All right. go ahead. So first, what I'd like to do is to make sure that we're clear on what we're actually considering right now. And the best way to do that, and Roberts would suggest we should do that, the famous Roberts Rules of Order. So I'd like to have a motion from one of the members of the committee on this request, and then we'll have discussion. It's probably gonna have to come from, from Jim or from Brian, since you all are familiar with the details. I'll make that motion. Uh, that was George Bell? Yes, sir, that's right. All right, so George has moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Dr. Bocello seconds, okay, thank you. So how much money is this for? It's uh, 38,000. 33, is that what you 38. said? 38. 38, okay. All right, so now we have a motion on the floor to um, uh, fulfill Winterville EMS funding request for $38,000. So what questions or comments do people have? Joe, did you have a question or yeah. A comment? Yeah, I do. Um, so if we look at, I can't remember, Brian, the numbers you just put. So it, is this 38, um, is this, these are recurring costs. You're going to need them every year. And, and so is the budget for 21, 22, how much did that increase from, or did that stay flat? So for, for the next year, we can, kept their budget the same as current level, but uh, they are a tier uh, one um, nonprofit squad. So they, they would have the ability next year if, if there was a need to come back and ask for an additional 15,000 um, to their budget. So I guess to, to Rick then, this is recurring expenses that you have, correct? Or, or is there something that happened this past year that? I, I would say that part of it is recurring. The 15,000 in insurance is recurring. The, over, the extent of overtime we had and due to illnesses and two week COVID quarantines and whatnot, I hope it's not recurring. 
Uh, I requested this year, uh, I think it was 478, which was about a 30, uh, $35,000 increase over prior year's budget. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, we're going to do all we can to keep the truck in service. The thing I'd, I'd forgot to say earlier, and this is not related to your question, so if Dr. Brown wants me to hush, I will. But we do ride two paramedics most of the time. And we're a busy squad. And to ask a paramedic to ride with the basic all the time and take all the calls, I don't think is realistic. And I think we have better care when we have two medics to bounce things off each other. And, you know, I'll knock on wood, Dr. Fertella loves to talk about cardiac arrest survival rates. And, you know, I am very uh, proud of what the rates our squad has been able to, uh, to do. And I think that's part of it, that we have two medics on the truck. Thank you again for considering okay. of the request. All right, any other questions? Uh, Dr. Brown, if I can. Sure. sure. I, I'd like to say that uh, the Rescue Association will support uh, Rick. I think he's made a good case, uh, and but he's not the only one. Everybody's uh, costs are keep uh, going up. Uh, and I do know what business Rick is in, and he absolutely is pinching every penny uh, that he can. So I think his, his request is realistic. He's made a good case. Uh, but again, I think uh, everybody else is pretty much in the same boat as well. All right. Thank you. Dr. Brown, this is Jim. Hey, Jim. Uh, I can go after you going to speak, but... No, go ahead. Uh, just would want to add, so um, the survival request, you know, Chief Ritz, uh, good supporter, good partner. Um, just being transparent with the committee, Winterville and Eastern Pines do have expenses that other squads don't have as they choose to purchase and furnish their own fleet. Um, and so they have insurance and uh, costs that, that others don't have. Um, it's just their, their choice, not, not uh, anything different. Um, one other thing as it relates to fund balances, you know, the, the counties, our EMS fund, fund balance is our savings, if you will. Um, any monies that the, the county doesn't spend similar to the general fund, you know, when spending is cut off uh, end of next month or whenever it's cut off for the rest of the year, um, all of the monies there return to the fund balance or into the general fund, as it were, you know, EMS money from the county goes back into the EMS fund balance. Um, the rescue squads are not subject to that, as Rick alluded to, you know, if he has extra, he'd be willing to give it back. Well, obviously, I understand, you know, the, the challenges with full-time personnel is, is different um, than, than with all hourly folks. But uh, that's not something that the rescue squads are subject to. So at the end of the year, uh, they do not have to turn back in whatever funds from the county that they did not use. And so they're maintaining their own individual funds, if you will, or savings as, uh, as their own nonprofits. And then the county is not subject to that. So uh, that's maybe something that should be considered. Um, you know, obviously things costs do go up. And the last thing I would say um, would be that, you know, with the price and the cost of all these supplies going up, it may be something that uh, we as county staff need to review having maybe one supply Ellen. repository of, Ellen, of IO needles and such. And then uh, it, having storages all around the county may not be the most efficient way. And so we'll just need to as we go forward, review some efficiencies um, and see what we can recommend back to the committee and the commissioners. So you're speaking in, are you speaking in favor of the motion or? I was just, just information only. I, okay. I, I mean, I'm, yeah. All right, does staff have a recommendation? I guess is what I'm asking. Well, I mean, um, I would defer to Brian, you know, he, uh, he knows more about the fund than I do. Um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm support. I don't have any reason to, to believe uh, nefarious activities are afoot. And uh, so 
So I think they're, they're being genuine. Um, and so we'll work okay. on it. Yeah, um, from a from a number standpoint, can can the fund afford it? Um, the simple answer is going to be yes. Um, we just ask that, as Jim alluded to, um, we are trying to build up the fund ballots. We are trying to make sure we're on good financial ground. And um, as Mr. Bell also noted, that some of our other squads also have needs. That if you probably noticed, all of our squads did ask for more money next year. Um, then, then we are recommending, and that was recommended tonight. But um, if you're if you're asking, can can we afford it this year? I do I don't I do not think it will put a financial hardship on the fund this year. All right. Any other questions? I do right. have a oh, go ahead, Kip. I'm sorry. I do have a question for Chief Britt, and the, uh, my question centers around um, since this seems to be um, a reoccurring uh, activity that's occurred, I guess, two years in a row, and knowing that we're moving into the next year, possibly with the tier system, um, are you beginning to put, put contingencies in place to mitigate that? Well, I'll, what we've done is brought on more staff, you know, so we have cut out overtime completely the last several payrolls, uh, which, you know, some of our providers are happy about that. It, and it's a balancing act because if you go out and you hire somebody, they want so many shifts. And then if you bring on more people and they can't get as many shifts, they're, they're out to go somewhere else. And when they can go work overtime at their full-time job and make time and a half versus, you know, what we pay, then it's a, it's a tough balancing act because all the squads are using the same pool of paramedics. Uh, so, but I have the luxury when somebody calls out and doesn't show up or they go take the overtime, I, I have to get one of my full-time guys to cover it or I have to cover it. Uh, but yeah, so again, we're looking at additional funding sources, uh, the, the motor fuel tax refund, the sales tax refund, continuing to do the photo fundraiser, uh, that funding is down from what it has been in prior years. But if we can keep the overtime under control and fuel costs don't go back through the roof like they did a few years ago, you know, with a, you know, maybe we could get by with a, a $25,000 increase versus a $35,000 increase. I just did, as Brian said, the simple math of here's where we are year to date at the end of December. I can double that number. And that's how I came up to 38 because we were exactly $19,000 in the hole. But we turn in the budget and what we spent every month to the, to the county. We emailed a spreadsheet. So it's no secret. It's right there. Um, you know. OK, thank you. Uh, Any other questions? All right, hearing none. Angela, will you do a roll call, please? OK. Charles Mayo? Yes. Kiplin Clemens? Yes. Joe Morgan? Yes. Jim MacArthur? Yes. Dr. Pratella? Yes. Mackenzie Newkirk? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Silvernail? Yes. George Bell? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like the uh, eyes have it. So this uh, passes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chief Britt, for being here as well. All right, that's our last item for discussion. And um, we're now open for questions or comments from the oversight committee members. Anyone have a question or comment? It's Joe, and um, given the discussion we just had, um, and I think Kiplin might have been um, thinking about this too, but I don't know. I do think we don't meet again until September. I do think it would be helpful if staff um, did have some kind of guidance on this contingency fund. Uh, when I sat there and did the math real quickly, it looked like we were assuming that a squad could ask one time per year. 
Um, that's what it just, you know, when I did the math, it looked like it came up to 67,500 if each squad asked for what they could contingency wise, the amount. So there, I think there is some guidance needed and we've got time to plan for that. Is there a time of year? I mean, can they ask for it right out of the gate in September or would we want to see a six months, you know, review like um, Chief Britt's done? I mean, those are things that I do think would help when we get to that bridge um, in the future, just food for thought. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions or comments as we get ready to close the meeting from the committee members? One more thing, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, no, go ahead. Dr. Dr. Silvernail, um, again, um, going back to what Portella was talking about, about all of us being um, advocates for the vaccine um, and putting on my public health hat for a second. Um, you now have an online portal that people can use. Um, is that correct? Is he there? Is he gone? Yep, I'm still here, Joe. Just getting myself unmuted. Okay. Um, yes, we do. Um, uh, Amy had worked with MIS to build that portal. Uh, we're using something called TimeTap as the scheduling system behind that. And it allows folks to go in through the county website uh, or it's also on the public health website and to self-schedule for our clinics. Uh, for those, if someone doesn't have computer access, there's still a phone option. Although we're trying to drive them through the, the self-schedule where we think that works better and is, uh, is received better by most folks. Uh, has worked very well. We're also exploring the option to directly schedule into Epic, which is our electronic health record, just like the hospital. Uh, there's some work on the backside of that uh, for MIS and for Vidant to make that work. Um, so we're, we're still exploring that. I don't see that happening probably for another month. So, so as the vaccine, um, where more and more people are going to be eligible for and people ask, where can I get it? Then we can direct them to the county website, mm -hmm. I guess, to Biden Health has continued to do their community clinics as well in partnership with all you guys um, and or private physicians, some of them doing it or not in our county. At, at this point, no, the private physicians offices are not being supplied. Uh, okay. They would have to apply to be a vaccine administrator. I think at some point we may get there, uh, but because this is a federal asset, they're trying to track it very closely. Um, I remember that. Yes. One of the one of the good news um, uh, that we heard last week is that CVS will be coming online in the near future uh, with in-store vaccinations, just like Walgreens is doing. Uh, so we are seeing growth in the number of vaccinators. Uh, the health department's doing it. Biden's doing it. We have the joint site at the convention center, which is really Biden's taking the lead on the county, so playing a supporting role. And then there are a number of other folks that have. Uh, you know, contributed staff or other resources to help get that site up and running. Uh, ECU Physicians is doing some vaccine. Uh, Paul Shackelford, um, uh, a gynecologist in town, been with ECU, then was with Biden. Now he's back with ECU. And uh, Paul is uh, leading some efforts on a mobile vaccine team. Uh, he's worked with us to go out and help do uh, some of our long-term care facilities. Uh, so we're, we're definitely seeing expansion of that. Uh, we've used the, the existing network of occupational health clinics. City of Greenville has done boosters for GFR for us. Their, their nurse uh, used to be my nurse when I was running Oc Health, And uh, we gave her vaccine to, to do the boosters for GFR for us and save, save time and space in our clinic. Um, Vidant runs clinics at other places in town, GUC, for example, and they've sent uh, some of the J&J &J vaccine there. I believe they've also sent some of that to, um, to Thermo Fisher. So. So it's getting out there. Uh, our clinic today was, was well attended. We did just shy of 250 folks. We had a few no-shows, uh, but, uh, but we're getting there. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions as we close out? Hey Mike, one, one thought for the group from my end since, since you got me up. A couple of summers ago, I, I started writing an infection control, infection prevention curriculum for, for pre-hospital providers or just generally emergency responders. Um, was really doing that. The state, or not the state fire academy, but the National Fire Academy used to have a um, infection control course. Hasn't been offered in many years. Uh, we used to teach it at the state level in New York, uh, at the New York State Fire Academy. And I really kind of started writing this in, as a fire academy course, but for any anybody that's a first responder, 
might be worthwhile to try to demo some of that material at some point when, when COVID settles down, help me refine it and uh, improve that course. Uh, also get the, the take on it from a first responders level. I know what I think they should know, but I wanna see if it's helpful to them. I, I don't think you can protect yourself from these infections if you don't understand how they move. And that's a big part of the course is understanding these infections and how they move between people. So I'm willing to, willing to put that out there at some point as continuing ed to demo it, help me refine the course uh, so I can strengthen that program. All right, great idea, thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Uh, Mike, if I can. Sure, George. Uh, I, uh, this question or comment, I guess, is for Jim, I think. Uh, Tuesday night, you mentioned that, uh, and I don't remember uh, if it was the health department or Vidant Medical, uh, able now to go out into the county and, and do vaccinations for people who are not able to travel to a vaccination site. Uh, if you make sure everybody here is aware of that uh, operation and uh, expound on it a little bit if you can. Yes, sure, Mr. George. Um, so uh, for, the, for the benefit of the committee, we, uh, the Community paramedicine program was approached by uh, Vidant. Um, some members of our steering committee had asked if there was a way that we could reach uh, shut-ins or homebound folks uh, that were in need of the vaccine that, that could not get to the convention center. Um, and so through partnership with the health department, um, public health has offered up the county's vaccine to county employees um, for us to use similar to our first responder clinics that we ran back in January, February. Um, and so uh, what we've done is we got a list from both public health and from Vidant of high risk folks that uh, need in-home vaccine. And um, it's, it's a fairly short list. So the, the first foray into this happened on uh, Tuesday of this week. Um, Michelle, our community paramedic and John Britt, they actually, he's our part-time uh, new, newest person. Um, they went out with the list. They reached out on Monday, several homeless folks and shut-ins. So uh, they actually went to several homes to make sure people were going to be home to receive the vaccine. And then on Tuesday, they went back out and touched base and they administered 10 uh, vaccines to those shut-ins and we actually have a list uh, growing again. Um, it's looking like we're gonna try from Monday of next week to do another uh, 10, maybe 11. Um, and of course, what I had, had reached out to the Rescue Association uh, was that if our EMS crews are seeing people that they know need to be vaccinated or want to be vaccinated, but lack the access, um, obviously we want to do our part to make sure that we can get them the access, right? So especially now that we have the, the J and J, the single shot uh, is much easier for the homeless population. We only have to find them one time. And uh, that's incredible uh, for Michelle is, is what we found out earlier this week was that this can be pretty challenging uh, when there's a time constraint. You know, the Moderna vaccine, we only have six hours to use it after drawing it up. Um, so it was a little bit harder when you had to travel house to house. But uh, they, they made that happen. And uh, Mr. George, the one that you reached out to me about, um, I've got a message out to um, somebody at Vidant because we don't have access to the Pfizer vaccine to reach that person you sent us. Um, so I can't give the second shot of Pfizer for them. But uh, we want people to know that we, we're doing our part. You know, our EMS crews are, are working at the convention center. Um, I personally, uh, along with two or three of our other medics, have been staffing the, the vaccine clinics at the Ag Center and the health department. And uh, we also, we realize that we can leverage our partnerships with both our rescue squads, our shift supervisors, our county employees, and our community paramedics to do shut-ins, right? Because they're all over the county. All I have to do is make sure that the paramedic has access to the vaccine and that we do the questionnaire properly and then we can administer those vaccines in the home if we need to. Um, it's a small group right now, but it is something that I think we can scale as needed. 
James, um, you want to come and so up it's a, it's going to be an incredible effort. Um, and as Dr. Silvernail, as you yeah, said, I'm really hopeful that we can move on from COVID something pretty soon. Thank you, that answer Jim. your question, George. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate it, bro. All right. Thanks. So, any last questions? Again, just know this year we moved to a new meeting schedule. We're meeting four times a year. So we normally haven't met in July. So we have a little longer period this time um, because of our scheduling. Um, everybody, I, I hate to say this, have a great summer. And uh, um, we'll see everybody back in September. And if we need to call a call meeting, we can do that um, uh, as well. So. Thanks everybody for what you've uh, been doing for the committee. Thanks to all the staff, all the providers, and um, I'll accept a, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Dr. Botella moves. Second. Dr. Yes. Second, Charles Mayo. Um, yes. And this one, we don't really need to take a roll call vote for everybody say aye, and then we'll go. All in favor say aye. aye. Okay. Super. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.